So I'm Paul Dobbins and I'm the Director of Impact Investing for Ecosystem Services at WWF and I focus on seaweed and shellfish farming. So I, I got involved in seaweed and shellfish farming, uh, really started back when I was a kid. I worked in the scallop industry here on the coast of Maine and, uh, and then left the, the industry and went to work in offices for about 25 years and realized that the coastal communities I had grown up in were really starting to suffer because the number of species we could fish was dwindling and you could start to see the impact of climate change. And so I uh, decided I would try to help uh, figure out how to create more jobs in these coastal communities and it came to aquaculture, uh, particularly seaweed and shellfish, because it could use the skills that we had uh, in our communities, it could use the assets we already had in the communities and there was a ready market for it. So in many of the coasts that we work on, um, seaweed is a very new industry. Um, but. Uh, seaweed farming goes back over 350 years. The oldest continuously operating seaweed farm is in Tokyo Bay, and it's over 350 years old. There are six countries in the Western Pacific that make up 98% of the seaweed harvest now. And when we think of um, the, the three northern ones, Japan, Korea, and China, seaweed farming evolved there because there wasn't a lot of arable land to support their growing populations. Every indigenous culture that, uh, that grew up around the ocean utilized seaweed as part of their, their, their diet. In some places like the U.S., we, we grew out of it, if you will, because of the advent of uh, modern foodstuffs, the ability to transfer and store food in refrigeration. Seaweed can be dried and it will last almost indefinitely. So if you have a country that doesn't have a lot of arable land, has a growing population, and it's a couple hundred years ago, seaweed was natural to help feed that society. What we're starting to see is other coastal communities are realizing uh, the benefits of it, and we as consumers are also realizing the nutritional benefits of it. So we're starting to see a little bit of a reemergence. What's great about seaweed farming is that it's the only ocean-based industry in the world that is led by women. Seaweed farming employs over five million women across the world and the majority of them are in the developed region of seaweed farming which are the six countries in Western Asia that produce 98 percent of the global crop but even in developing areas of seaweed farming, like our coast of Maine, this is a woman-led industry. The CEOs are women, the farmers are women. It's really an amazing thing to see, no matter what country you go to. One of the things that we, we've seen occur on, on our coast here in Maine is that the young women that are getting into uh, seaweed and shellfish farming are from fishing families. It it's, seems to be a natural progression as fishing uh, runs into challenges due to climate change and fish stocks. These, these young women and, and, and young men want to work on the water. They want to continue that family tradition of earning a living from the ocean. And this is just a natural progression for many of them. Advancing seaweed farming is important both for the climate and for our communities. Seaweed farms absorb carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and phosphorus, three nutrients we have too much of in many of our bays, and provide oxygen just through the process of growing because they photosynthesize. The harvest that comes out of the water is created without any arable land, fresh water, or fertilizers and it's highly nutritious and can be used to displace other terrestrially grown feedstocks that have higher inputs. And seaweed farming creates jobs in our coastal communities and contributes to our food security. At WWF, we're very concerned about the environment and there are always trade-offs whenever you want to have a human activity 
uh, advance a human activity. And so while we, we know there are a lot of benefits to seaweed, there are also some challenges and concerns that we have that we're addressing through our programmatic work and through our partner organizations like the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Science, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and many, many others. So as an environmental organization, we worry about uh, creating a monocrop. We want to make sure that there's good regulation in place so that seaweed doesn't end up filling up our bays and creating monocrops and crowding out other organisms. We want to learn from the lessons of terrestrial farming that's been going on for 10,000 years and adopt them to aquatic farming, which really is, is still in its infancy. We worry about uh, marine mammal entanglement. So we, we, we don't want to see a whale get entangled in a seaweed farm. Now, in the history of seaweed farming, we have not come across a credible report of a marine mammal being entangled in a seaweed farm. But if the industry continues to grow, we want to make sure we're taking steps both from a regulatory standpoint and from a technology standpoint to keep that, what the data would su suggest is a, a very low probability event, but it has a tremendous impact. And so we, we work to make sure that we're mitigating any risk uh, that we can as we advocate for more of this human activity on the water. I get excited about this because I see the effect it's having on the coastal communities I grew up in here in Maine, but I've also had the opportunity to visit coastal communities around the world that are struggling with the same issues and are addressing those issues through seaweed and shellfish farming. And it's really exciting to see that no matter what coast you seem to go on in the world, we share a common bond and a common love for the ocean and a common desire to work on the ocean and create highly nutritious food for consumers. And that's really exciting to be able to do that in a way that improves our climate and improves our coastal communities' economic resiliency. It's amazing.